Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Megger's Testing Tactics webinar series. Today's topic is low voltage circuit breaker ground fault protection utilizing primary injection test method. My name is Michael Fleischer, and I'm the digital marketing specialist from Megger. I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation and supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenter. On the right side of your screen, you will see a control panel that looks similar to this one. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing in the box highlighted in red, and I will read the questions out during the Q&A segment at the end of the webinar. Additionally, a certificate of attendance, copy of the presentation, and link to the recording of this webinar will be sent to all attendees in two business days. Our presenter today is Daniel Carreño, Applications Engineer. Also to assist with the question and answer session, we will have joining us Dinesh Chajer, Technical Support Group Manager, and Jason Aaron, Applications Engineer. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today, Daniel. Thank you, Michael, and, and good morning to you. Good morning to, to um, my colleagues, Dinesh, uh, Aaron, and of course, our audience. Um, this is, of course, the last installment of the Testing Tactics webinar series, and we're glad that you are able to, to join. Of course, we, we hope that you find this information useful. Okay, as, as Michael mentioned, uh, we're going to discuss uh, how to test the ground fault protection testing on low voltage circuit breakers with uh, the primary injection method, right? We're going to cover, I'm going to start with um, the reason behind this, uh, of course, talking about the standards, right? Uh, in those documents that will give us the guidelines for this uh, uh, test uh, in field. We're going to cover some of the basics to understand, you know, the types of um, ground fault protection uh, schemes, and again, why we are using this method to to test them. And we're going to go on the step by step um, or the requirements to 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 run these measurements in in the field, as well as the challenges right, that we'll, we'll face. Some challenges when um, um, trying to perform these tests, and of course. If, if we know those, if we know how to tackle them, of course that that will make us um, like easier, right? In in the field to be successful when we need to test uh, this type of protection on those uh, circuit breakers. So let's go ahead and, and start again with stand right the documents uh, that uh, discuss this topic and why uh, this is important. And I'll start with the NFPA 70. Right, the National Electric Code, which um, until 2014, right, when we reviewed this section of the code, uh, and more specifically, Article 230.95, right, with the requirement for ground fault protection and with the requirement to test this uh, protection element in my breaker again until all the way up until 2014 the recommendation from from this standard which of course is is really important is that the the testing itself was left to either manufacturer or contractor recommendations right oftentimes uh, this uh, left the, again this decision to the contractor and uh, and again a lot of times this uh, ended up being just ourselves or the, the individuals in the field just going to the trip unit, pressing the trip button, the breaker trip, yes, our protection or the, the ground for protection is working. So that, that was changed in 2017, right? So this uh, latest uh, or version 2017 of the NEC um, change this uh, clause uh, clause C of that article, and now it requires us to test this ground fault protection element with primary injection uh, method, right? So really, really big change in the sense that now it's a requirement for us to test, and not only that, but it gives us special or, or very uh, clear instructions on what which method to use for the measurements again so it's it's primary injection if we look at the NEMA AB4 right another very important document when it comes to 
low voltage uh, circuit breakers. We still see the same recommendation as, as the previous versions of the NEC. We're going to um, uh, or leaving that decision to manufacturers uh, primarily. And if we look at the NIDA documents, both the acceptance testing standard and the maintenance testing uh, standards, very similarly to the NEC, uh, it detects that we should use uh, primary injection to determine both the ground fault pickup and the time delay for this uh, particular uh, protection element. It goes into details into telling us that to verify, for example, polarities to, of, of the CTs involved in, in this uh, protection element. And again, uh, will give us uh, instructions to, to test both the pickup and the time delay. It will also give us guidelines for the, the results, right? And basically, we can uh, categorize those uh, in two. The trip test for which conditions the circuit breaker should trip. And that basically, as you can see in the current slide, is when the current direction is in the same relative uh, or, or in the same direction relative to the polarity marks of the two CTs involved in the test. And then we have the not trip test, right? So the circuit breaker shouldn't operate when the current direction is opposite relative to those uh, polarity marks in the two CTs involved in the test. So again, we can group the, the measurements on trip tests and not trip tests. We're gonna look into the detail how to make connections and, and a little bit more detail on what to expect how to perform these two types of uh, measurements. Of course, we have the pickup, right? We need to determine the pickup value for this uh, protection element. And again, NIDA uh, dictates here that this value, this pickup value should be between 90% up to 125% of the setting or up to 1200 amps, whichever is smaller, right? Which is really, really important if, if we read carefully, we'll know now that if, uh, I mean, for those uh, breakers that have a, a higher current rating, no matter uh, after I um, go above certain threshold, I still will look at the pickup value to be maximum to be a maximum of 1200 amps. This is this is really important to, to keep in mind. I'll, I'll explain why in a couple of slides. Uh, for the timing, of course, then uh, it will refer to either manufacturer specs or will refer back to the, uh, the NFPA 70, the NEC, saying that uh, the timing should, shouldn't be longer than one second at 3000 amps, right? So either uh, manufacturer or back to the NEC. So that's basically what we have in terms of, of standards. Again, the requirement uh, change in 2017, making the, the test now mandatory for, for, those, for those breakers that have this protection element and that we have to perform it with primary injection. So let's go now to our next uh, section, which is uh, basics of, of ground fault protections. Of course, uh, our objective today is not to discuss the ground fault protection scheme itself, but I wanted us you know, to be in the same page for us to be able to go into the testing uh, portion. We'll have, or there are several different methods to detect this, uh, this type of uh, fault or to sense this type of faults in, in, in the system with our circuit breaker. As you can see, we have the residual uh, uh, sense configuration, either three pole or four pole. We also have the option to have an external neutral uh, CT, the zero sequence, and the source ground return. We're going to focus in these two the three pole residual and the three pole external neutral CT. Why? Because those are the most common uh, types of uh, configurations that you'll find in the field according to our experience. So that's where we're selecting those two to, to, to uh, go and review the, the testing method. Okay, so three pole 
and an external uh, neutral CT. Now, when we perform these uh, uh, measurements, understanding the CT polarity and the uh, proper external uh, neutral CT, in case we have one, like in the example I'm, I'm showing you now in the slide, this uh, Danger might took it directly. I don't know if you can see the the, the Micrologix uh, 6 uh, label in that box in the middle. So directly from a manufacturer manual, uh, and, and actually that section of which I took this, this diagram explains the external uh, neutral CT connections, right? And this particular example, uh, the, the manual will tell us that if the supply is via the bottom, then you have to wire, as you, you see the external CT here, the CT a certain way. And of course, if the supply is at the bottom, you have to not only reverse these connections, but also change certain connections here for, for the control. So really, really important that, that again, we understand the, the CT polarity and the proper connections according to the manufacturing uh, manufacturer specs. Uh, of course, this is extremely important to follow, especially when we are doing acceptance testing, right? To have those uh, manuals available and again, carefully review the, the instructions for wiring in case we are doing those or if we are checking that, that the wire, we didn't uh, do the wiring, but we're checking that uh, that is uh, correct. Again, of utmost important that we have a good understanding on those connections. When we look at the settings, right, again, using the same uh, trip unit, uh, micrologic uh, trip unit, this is our panel, right, for, for the settings of the breaker. So when I make a zoom to the, 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 the settings for which we are going to be able to change the, the settings for pickup, and time delay of our of our uh, brownfall protection element. I'm going to zoom since I think it's a little bit small. So you can see here at the bottom of those uh, dials, I have my brownfold uh, section. So the first one on the left, right, the dial with the the letters from A to J will determine our pickup value, and the second one to the right will determine our, our time delay uh, uh, setting. So let's look at how that is uh, shown in the table. If we go to the manual for that uh, trip unit, I'm going to make a zoom as well, just to make sure you are able to see it. Do you remember right on the pickup uh, 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 dial, I have, again, positions on in letters from A to J. And as you can see, I have basically four ways or, or four uh, rows here in this table and that I select the proper one for my record depending on my uh, nominal current. If my nominal current, as you can see in the, the second row, when I'm zooming in, I don't have a pointer, one second. In the second row here, if my nominal current is below or equal to 400 amps, well, depending on which position I'm in, then it's going to be a multiplier, right, for my pickup value. So if I'm on, let's say on A, then my pickup value is 0.6 times my nominal current. And of course, the same applies if my nominal current is between 400 amps all the way to 1250, then I will use the second row. But now something interesting happens when I go either 1250 or above, right? When my nominal current is either 1250 or more for my circuit breaker, then that dial stops being a, a, a multiplier. If, if you see, now it's actually a peak of value in itself. If I'm on, on position A, as you can see in the table, then my peak of value is 500 amps and so on and so forth. And if you remember that uh, slide that we saw at the beginning saying that it's either 125% of nominal or 1200 amps, whichever is smaller, this is reflected here in this table, which again is, is taken directly from, from an actual circuit breaker manual. 
And again, as you can see, no matter what the, 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 the current is, is, if it's above or, or equal or above 1250 or 1250 amps, the maximum peak of value for ground fault protection will be 1200 amps. Okay. So really, really important. And of course, this applies for all bugs with this, this protection. And of course, I have the, the section of the table that will also detect the, the time delay configuration for, for this breaker. So of course, I have to take note of, of these two before I, I, I go and perform the measurement. So make sure you check them. And of course, when you look at the results, when you look at the timing, depending on which position you are uh, for the delay, you will be pretty much selecting a curve from, from the, the time current curve uh, in, in the manual or, or the one that the, the manufacturer uh, provided for that particular breaker. So for, for results analysis, of course. Right, so th those are again the the the, the concepts and, and the factors that we have to check in the circuit breaker in the configuration to understand what we need to measure and how we analyze the result, which uh, in terms of analysis is pretty much comparing right our results to the the the, the time current curve to see if they fall within the acceptable values. And so now let's go ahead and talk about the testing itself, right? And I mentioned a few times now right, that, that per the NEC, per uh, NIDA recommendations, we have to perform this by the means of a primary current injection method. So what is primary current injection? Right? Again, just to make sure we are all in the same page, right? Um, why is it called primary current injection, right? Well, with this method, we're pretty much emulating field conditions, right? And by that, I mean uh, we're duplicating, we're using the same current values as the circuit breaker will see, will experiment in the field, in service in case there is a fault of, of that uh, nature. And of course, the breaker has to, to trip. Why do we have to use this in, uh, as opposed to, for example, a secondary injection where, where that method will be pretty much simulating, right? Uh, as opposed to emulating the field conditions, right? If, if we use secondary injection, we are just simulating or replicating certain conditions, but not duplicating the conditions that will, the breaker will again experience in the field. And again, the, the importance of using primary injection lies in that when you duplicate those conditions, you're pretty much, uh, again, using the same current as the breaker will, will see in field conditions in a controlled environment. Of course, you will be able to verify all the components of the circuit breaker involved in, in that operation, right? As you can see here, the, the of course, the mechanism, the main uh, contacts, the, the ion chambers, the trip unit itself, the terminal connections, right? Which, uh, of course, it might sound that is a really simple thing to check. We can, of course, do uh, contact resistance as an extra layer of, of, of testing for, for my terminal connections and, and main contact system of the breaker. But again, in the case of a ground fault, we want to make sure that the circuit breaker will be able to interrupt that uh, high current. So using this method, we'll, we'll, we will be using all elements involved, all elements of the breaker involved in, in operating when this condition is, uh, when this condition happens in the field. Now for connections, right? If, if you have been performing not only ground fault uh, uh, protection testing on circuit breakers, but all the others, if you're testing just the, the breaking capabilities of the breaker for short circuit or for your long time or short time uh, elements, you'll find the connections pretty familiar, right? You need, of course, a current source and you can inject the current on each one of the phases to perform um, 
the, the measurements again phase by phase in the case of a, a three phase breaker. And for the knot trip, you have to, to connect a jumper in between two, two phases. And I'm of course showing here uh, the different uh, connections depending on the type of, of sensing configuration that you have for uh, your circuit breaker. And, and again, you'll find these connections pretty familiar. And, and you, if we even pay closer attention, you will see that the trip and not trip uh, connections are actually reversed as when you are testing again, either your long time, short time, or, or in, in instantaneous for those breakers that have uh, the ground fault protection element uh, either enabled or, or integrated in the breaker. So again, pretty, pretty familiar connections when, when we talk about circuit breaker testing with primary injection. So let's go ahead and look at the trip test in, in more detail. Again, we, we saw the connections. I'm showing them here again. Pretty straightforward. We only connect to one um, phase of my breaker. It is the same if I have the three pole or the three pole with the external uh, neutral CT. And we first have to determine pickup, right? There are two ways to do this, either using the pulse method or the run-up method. If you use the run-up method, right, used uh, of course a lot, you will pretty much will start injecting. Uh, uh, of course, you you know, right, that the, what is your your range of current that you expect uh, because of you you checking the settings of of the breaker or the, of the trip unit. Of course, you start injecting uh, again in that range. But you do a continuous injection, right? So you have your your instrument, you start the injection, and of course you have manual control of that current, and you can slowly go up up until the breaker trips. And of course, whenever the breaker trips, that's your your pickup value. Uh, but there is a, a or or we prefer the pulse method. Why, right? As I said, when you do the run up, you're continuously injecting current. And of course, right, when, when we do that, we're going to start, I mean, we're passing a, a current through through our circuit breaker. And of course, we're going to heed um, uh, the, the conductors of, of my circuit breaker. And of course, that can uh, change the, the, the dripping characteristics, right? We also have our, our, our thermal protection. So that's what we prefer or we recommend to use the pulse method. So rather than using a continuous injection, you can configure your 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 instrument to do pulses, right? And in most instruments, or or if your instrument allows, you can in the settings say, okay, I want to for when I do momentarily or or pulses um, injections, I want to use 10, 20, 15 cycles. So when you use that method, you start, we recommend starting at 70% of the pickup, you do a pulse. If the record doesn't trip, of course, you do a step in current, you do another pulse and so on and so forth until you, you find your pickup value. That way we avoid hitting the, the, the elements, the projection elements of the breaker and again, changing the, the dripping characteristics or influencing that and getting a, a, a not so accurate result for my pickup, right? So. Again, the, the pulse method is preferred to, to determine that. Once we have the pickup, then we can go on to determine the time delay, right, for each pole. And we can start by using 150% uh, of that pickup value. Of course, uh, you, then you will do a continuous injection. You can configure your instrument to inject for, of course, longer than the delay setting. Just to make sure, of course, that you cover in case the breaker is tripping after that, of, uh, and again, you use uh, the continuous uh, method. And once you have your recording, as we saw before, you can compare against your time uh, current curve for that breaker. Going on now to the no trip test, right? Then we, I mean, we already have the pickup. Our connections will be different, right? Uh, and again, if we compare these connections, as you can see, we have to. Uh, short or have a use a jumper right to connect two phases 
in series, uh, as you can see, both for the not trip and the, and the uh, I'm sorry, both for the trip uh, pole and the external uh, neutral CT. Uh, you use the, the two phases, or in the case of the, the neutral, you use the neutral as a return path. And, and of course, on these tests, we expect that the breaker will not trip. What are we accomplishing then if the breaker will not trip? Well, a really, really important objective of this test, right? We also use 150% uh, of pickup setting for longer than the time delay, right? And um, Again, if the breaker is not tripping, what are we measuring? Well, we are making sure that the CTs of, of the circuit breaker are installed correctly. By, by installed correctly, I mean a phase that the, the polarity is correct and also the size. Right? I'll, I'll cover a little, in a little more detail in a couple uh, slides. And actually, the next one, which is uh, the sizing, we, as I mentioned, we verify the polarity, but also the size or, more technically, the ratios. Right, the ratios should be matched, uh, and you can actually perform an extra test, which is the one I'm, I'm showing you right now. Um, and on these these configuration, as you can see, the connections are a, a little, little bit different in in the direction. Right, as if I go back to my previous slide then I am actually injecting the current in the same direction, right? And what you will have to see here is that for whatever your test current is, if you look at the trip unit readings, the current reading should be twice of your test current. Again, purpose of this test is to verify the, the, the ratios of the CD, which should be much also, of course, really important for proper operation of uh, this uh, protection element. So that, those are basically the measurements that you have to perform. Again, not difficult. I mean, if you are already familiar with, with the testing, the other protection elements of the super baker, uh, testing the ground for protection, again, it's just a matter of knowing the proper connections to, to perform and of course uh, what to look for and how do I analyze my results which again really simple comparing my, my values against the the time current curve and in the case of the external neutral CT well again the facing right the connection the polarity and the size uh, are, are the two parameters that I need to make sure that are uh, both installed uh, correctly and in good working condition. So what are the challenges, right? It sounds uh, pretty simple, but what are the challenges that we will face uh, in the field when we are performing these measurements? First, uh, the power source for our instrument. Uh, ground flow uh, protection testing is probably special in the sense that, yes, we need a primary injection instrument, and we're going to look at that at the very end of the session. Uh, the good news is, is I mean, yes, uh, it's a primary injection unit, but it's, it won't be a, a huge or really large. So uh, uh, is is a little bit less of a concern as opposed to when, for example, testing my uh, uh, like short circuit or, or instantaneous uh, protection element of my breaker. But still, you want to make sure that you have a proper uh, power source to. To, to energize your, your instrument, your test instrument, right? That either if you're turning off um, your, your a building circuit right, or your facility circuit, or if you're using a generator, an inverter, and especially important, right? You want to make sure that either that generator or that inverter has the proper uh, power quality, right? Remember mo most of, of these instruments will of course you are uh, stepping the, the current up, so you have a transformer inside it. If you're feeding uh, with bad quality power, well, you will get something really similar or pretty much that you will get that in the output. And of course, that can uh, affect um, your results. So again, make sure the power source that, that you're going to be using is uh, it's um, yeah, proper, uh, properly sized and again, in terms of power quality that that you, you are sure that that won't affect your, your test results. 
breaker configuration, right? Uh, starting with the connection method, either top fit and bottom fit. Why is this important? Because of access. I'm going to show you a, a few pictures uh, later, right? Especially when we talk about uh, uh, power circuit breakers, which is my next uh, point. Uh, access becomes also like a, a challenge, something I, uh, I need to review, be mindful of before heading out to the field. Maybe I need longer cables or certain special provisions to be able to connect to my, my uh, terminals of my circuit breaker. Features, right? Again, especially when we, we talk about power circuit breakers, thermal memories, some selective interlocking, some switches or under voltage coils that will have to be energized so you can actually perform the measurements. Again, of course, uh, important that you are aware of those in case you need to to to, to work with those uh, switches defeating. In some cases, you, you shouldn't, right? Especially in, in facilities that are already, if you have a, so only a section um, isolated for you to work again, make sure that you can work with those uh, switches. And again, if you need external um, uh, power sources, which is my next point, the trip units, right? Sometimes you need either external power or a secondary injection tester. For some breakers, the secondary injection tester is, is a device that typically the manufacturer of the, the breaker uh, provides. And, and again, sometimes is, that is actually needed for you to, to power up the, the trip unit, change certain things to put it in, in maintenance mode so you can actually perform the measurements. So really important that you uh, investigate that before heading out to, to the field and, and take the measurements. Uh, connections, uh, of course, we have the options of using cabling or bus. Uh, and of course, as we mentioned, right, when it pertains to ground fault testing, we already established that no matter how well if we are dealing with breakers of uh, with nominal currents of higher than, than 1250, the maximum current that we will need for this particular test is 1200. So that makes it easier, right? We now can say that, but, um, sorry, cabling is preferred for ground for uh, testing, right? It's, it's easier to 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 connect to to manage uh, in the field. So, and because again, we are we know for a fact that the maximum current that we're going to be testing with is 1200 amps. Then again, we can establish that uh, cables will be enough to perform these particular measurements. The length also becomes a, an important factor to consider, right? Um, as well as thickness, right? Of course, our, our connections from our instrument, as you can see in the picture, to the breaker, uh, those cables that I'm using to connect to the breaker will be part of the circuit connected to the output of my unit, right? And, and the impact that it has is, of course, impedance, right? Which is my next slide. Uh, we want, of course, to, to minimize that impedance so we can actually achieve our, our, our current, especially when we talk about those larger currents, but in our case, 1200 amps. Um, if you are ever in the field with, with your instrument where right, you're performing, and, and of course, this applies not only to ground fault testing, but primary injection in general, uh, whenever you are having issues achieving uh, your test, your desired test current, there are certain uh, uh, steps you can take to, to minimize the impedance of that circuit. And of course, first I already mentioned, right, the, the length and the, the, the thickness or the cross-section area of the conductors uh, you're using is a big, big factor. The, of course, the longer the cable or the bus is, of course, the, 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 biggest, the, the bigger the impedance will be, and the thicker the conductor or cable it is, the lower the impedance will be for, for that uh, particular conductor. So either you can shorten the, the, the length of those cables or increase the size of them to reduce your, the, the impedance of that circuit. Really important when you are using, um, especially cables, avoid 
loops or windows, right? arranging them in a way that you are creating a, a big loop or a big window in between the two the two conductors, or as I'm showing you in the picture, right? Sometimes because of the, the test current, we actually need to use two, three, or more cables on each connection to because again the, the current that we are utilizing for our test. If that is the case, you can actually twist them. And let me uh, zoom to, to this section in, in my uh, slide. When, and of course, a really easy to follow uh, a recommendation, right? But also really easy to, to make it incorrect. As, as you can see, and just for the clarity, we use two colors here. And if you see on this current box that we have at the bottom, right? We have the polarity mark on the left with the, the black uh, dot. And those two conductors that go out from that side of, of my current box are black. On the other side, I have gray cables. And when we say, okay, you have to create twisted pairs of those conductors, we mean that you have to take one conductor of each side of your, your current box to create those twisted pairs. Again, oftentimes I've met it many times, especially when I have more than two cables per connection, it's really easy to, 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 to get it wrong and, and twist two cables from the same side of my current box, which will accomplish nothing in terms of reducing the impedance. Uh, and again, really easy in the field because in, in, I would say 99% of the cases, our actual test cables are not color coded on each side, right? All of them will be the same color. So be mindful of this. You have to create these twisted pairs with uh, cables in, in technical terms with cables with the current direction opposed to each other. So that's how we 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 reduce the, the impedance neutralizing the flux that those currents are creating right around the, the cable. So that's why we need cables from opposite sides of the current box. So that's how you again some tips, some recommendations to minimize the impedance and achieve your test current in case you're having trouble achieving it. Right, access as I already mentioned, right, especially with, with power circuit breakers, really important to, to take into account having the, the correct length of cables, the, the accessories needed to, to connect balls or, or vice grips or clamps to, to connect to the breaker. Uh, some, some examples or some pictures of those secondary trip units needed to be able to test uh, certain breakers, like this one I'm showing in, in the picture, right? So that's why we have that port in my, my trip unit to be able to connect that secondary injection unit and, and be able to, to, en to enable the circuit breakers for, for, for maintenance uh, uh, testing. Connections, as you can see, as I, I was mentioning, right, the length of the cable. In this example, we're using bias grips. Also, really important. I'm sure. Let me show you a couple more, either bias grips or clamps. Uh, of course, we want to to make sure that those connections are tight. That the 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 contact resistance between my cable, my test cable, and the circuit breaker terminal is minimized. And again, sometimes we use bolted connections, preferred, but yes, uh, it will take a little bit longer. We need the hardware. So sometimes we recur to, again, using vice grips or clamps. You just got to make sure that uh, that you don't damage the terminal of the circuit breaker, right? Which, I mean, easy to do, especially with, with vice grips. So be, be mindful of that as well. Couple of more examples. In this case, connecting to the external neutral CT. Right, you can see the jumpers here on the picture on the left. Right, to to connect to to the neutral of that uh, circuit breaker. So that's pretty much uh, the the challenges. And I want to use the last few minutes of, of my presentation. We're nearing the end of the presentation just to talk about 
the SPAN-A225, right? So obviously a primary injection test unit. And if you know the MECR portfolio, of course, it, it is not the only unit uh, that we have uh, for primary injection uh, measurements, right? We have a very wide, I'm showing here only, let's say, uh, 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 the representatives of each families, right? Our, our primary injection portfolio is, is very wide, but you can see we, we have units um, from 500, 900 amps that go all the way up to 60,000 amps. And of course, we have the SPI, which maximum short circuit is 2,000 amps, right? And it's a, a new generation type of instrument. So I want to give you some details on why I say it's a new generation. And of course, right, the, the capability of, of the SPI being able to inject up to 2,000 amps makes it ideal is it wasn't designed with the ground for uh, uh, protection testing specifically you can actually run all the other measurements on low voltage circuit breaker rated of 225 amps hence the name but again we we saw that maximum current needed for ground for protection testing is 1200 amps so that makes the spy uh, ideal to 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 have if um, I'm running this type of uh, test. Why um, I'm saying that this is the next generation of primary injection testers? Well, we know that the high current capability and even we can get up to 2000 amps. It is the smallest uh, primary injection system in its class. Uh, and the output current regulation control is, is really important. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. Right, so starting with automatic regulation and the current decay elimination, right? Especially when we are running those long delay uh, tests, right? we start with a continuous uh, injection of, let's say, a thousand amps. And as we mentioned, right, we start, we're going to start heating up the elements in my in my circuit breaker, and that will make the impedance change. So typically that results in current decay. So you will get a, 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 if you look at the current in a um, oscilloscope, you can see that the current will actually decrease while well, the spy is always uh, monitoring the impedance of the, the, the circuit and it will adjust to keep the current constant. You also get the DC offset elimination, so no more, and that is automatic. You don't have to, to change anything. What you have to do is, um, sorry, here when I went ahead. Um, no, no configurations, no more, no more fiddling with the firing angle. The unit will always make sure that no DC component is present in the output. So you make sure that whatever you get in the ammeter reading, that's what the, the unit is injecting. Uh, although not useful for, for, for ground for protection, the system can, or a SPI-225 can be parallel or series connected with up to four units to increase either the current or the open circuit voltage capability. If you're familiar with, with PowerDB, right, our, our prime uh, power um, or testing uh, management software, that is what we use to control the SPI, either with that computer or with a dedicated uh, touch view interface. So, and the software looks and behaves the same, exact same on again, both the STBI or the computer. Uh, when you use the, the dedicated software, the dedicated form uh, or virtual form for the SPI, the software has or includes thousands of, of time current curves for circuit breakers. Right, so that way you don't have to take the, 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 the PDF or even the printout uh, to check and, and manually review your results. The curves are integrated and, and, and the software will actually plot the result in the curve and it will automatically tell you if that is a pass or a fail for that particular breaker. If the circuit breaker you're testing um, is not in the library, of course, you can send us a PDF, we'll digitize it and include it in the library for you. And as I already mentioned, the, the report is automatically generated. So pretty much ready to, to save as a PDF or print in just a, a couple clicks. And with that, I 
we'll send it back to to Mike to go over the the questions round. Thank you, Daniel. So at this time, the presentation portion of our webinar is officially concluded. We'll now take some time to answer as many questions as possible. If you have any questions, please submit them now into the Q&A box on the GoToWebinar control panel. For those of you that are leaving, when you close the webinar window, a survey should pop up on the screen. We would greatly appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback so we can continue to improve upon our future webinars. On the survey, there's a field where you can also request a demo or a quote on any mega products. A copy of this presentation, certificate of attendance, and a link to the video recording of this webinar will be emailed to everyone in about two business days. You can also view video recordings of previous webinars, as well as register for upcoming webinars on our website at us.mega.com webinars, and register for our next webinar on January 15th, titled Fundamentals of Transformer Commissioning and Maintenance Testing. Now let's get to your questions. The first one I have, I'm going to direct to Dinesh Chajer. Dinesh, at which voltage level do breakers require primary injection testing? Under 2.4 kV? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's, it's a good question. Uh, so usually, uh, as per IEEE and NC qualification, we have defined the breakers into low voltage circuit breakers, medium voltage, and, and high voltage circuit breakers. And primary injection is typically reserved or utilized for low voltage circuit breaker. And as per uh, as per IEEE, um, um, uh, any breaker with a voltage rating of 1000 volt or less are considered as low voltage circuit breakers. So it's, it's a quite uh, industry practice that uh, people would use primary injection testing for any voltage or any circuit breaker rated um, uh, less than 1000 volts. And one other point I would like to mention is that when you are doing the primary injection test, you are performing the test at high current and low voltage level. Uh, usually the volt, the output voltage from the instrument is anywhere in the range of zero to six volts. So it is not a destructive test. Uh, the, the, the cases when, um, when they are doing qualification test at manufacturing sites, that's when they, they, they do these destructive tests where you are applying uh, the, uh, the high voltage and high current at the same time. Uh, so just think about a circuit breaker in operation. Uh, it, it may have a 480 volt service or uh, whatever the voltage level is. And at that time, if a current, current, um, uh, if a fault happens, then the current would be in hundreds of amps. So in those situations, you might be dealing with high voltage and high current at the same time. But this test, this offline primary injection test that we are talking about is not a destructive test because you are using a low voltage and high current concept. Thank you, Dinesh. Uh, our next question is going to go to Jason Aaron. Uh, Jason, is the 90 to 125% tolerance for the pickup test based on manufacturer recommendations? Okay, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. And, and this is a good question to kind of emphasize uh, a point that Daniel brought up in his presentation when he was talking about uh, the ground fault uh, pickup testing. And when he talked about that that test, um, he he said that it's preferred to do the pulse method for that test. So basically, you want to um, sneak up on it as you increase your your current level and um, apply it to the um, to the device until until it trips. And uh, this 90 to 125% tolerance uh, for that value um, comes from the NIDA standard um, that Daniel referenced for both the acceptance testing standards and the maintenance testing standards. However, um, it is important to understand that there are uh, manufacturer spec specifications whenever it comes to these systems. So it's really important to understand uh, what the application is um, from the manufacturer because they may have a slightly different tolerance. However, in the absence of those tolerances, that's where these NIDA standards come in so that you have a guideline to go by whenever you're performing these types of tests. Thank you, Jason. 
Uh, next, back over to Dinesh. Is primary injection required both by the manufacturer and in the field at its final location? So uh, it, it's, uh, it's a very interesting question because the answer, which we don't like to hear, is it depends. Uh, so when you start talking about manufacturer, what they would do or they might do is that they might do what we call a type test in the sense that uh, if they have, they won't perform this uh, primary injection testing on every single breaker, but they might perform it on a certain type of breaker, um, um, uh, a certain type or model of the breaker and use that as a reference uh, measurement uh, for all the breakers of that class and model. Uh, so that's very standard. Usually you don't get the, 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 the manufacturer's test results. Uh, typically you would go and ask for it and those kind of things. So that's not very common. Um, now, primary injection, as Daniel mentioned in his presentation, that uh, when you have a trip unit on it, or the breaker is a thermal magnetic breaker where it has brains and power at the same time or in the same body or in the same configuration. In, in all of those cases, primary injection is the right method um, uh, or is, is, the, is, is the only method that can check not only the, the, uh, the, uh, the trip uh, sensing capabilities or, or whether the breaker would trip or not. And in addition to that, it would also check that whether breaker would indeed trip or not. Um, we, we also have methods like secondary injection methods where uh, you only check the brains of breaker where you just send a signal to the trip device. And if the breaker, uh, if the trip device or the trip unit operates, we know that the we assume that the breaker would trip in real life conditions as well. But primary injection is a cell, like it tests both. And because of that reason, uh, uh, when you're doing commissioning testing or when there is an outage at a data center hospital, um, uh, it is typical of, of, of uh, technicians and engineers to perform primary injection test. And uh, there are some other tests that go along with this, like insulation resistance, um, a low resistance measurement. Um, uh, so th those are some of the other tests that you would do on breakers, low voltage circuit breakers. But coming back to primary injection, it's a very standard test that is recommended during commissioning and maintenance just because of the value that it provides. Thank you, Dinesh. Next, we'll go over to Jason. Uh, Jason, what is the TCC? So the TCC is the time current curve and the time current curve is uh, comes from the manufacturer of whatever um, device that you're testing, whether it be um, a ground fault relay on a bolted pressure switch or um, <clears throat> or a circuit breaker um, with the external uh, neutral CT or whatever the application may be that um, uh, Daniel gave many different examples. And uh, what that time current curve has is it's a plot of um, the interrupting times for an overcurrent device based on uh, a given current level. So, um, and Daniel brought one up uh, in the presentation. I think it was on slide 17, um, if we can see that. And um, basically what, um, what that's gonna do is, um, based on the amount of current that you apply to the, to the device, um, it's going to um, base, tell you um, how fast that device is going to operate or how fast it's going to react um, at that current level. Thanks, Jason. And uh, while I have you, if the main breaker is connected to a utility transformer, does it need to be disconnected from the main breaker in order to do the GF test? Uh, well, the short answer to this is, is no, it doesn't. Um, as uh, some of the examples that uh, Daniel gave whenever he was showing how to connect the test set, um, all you really need to do is to connect uh, the device in that manner and ensure that um, the current flow that you have um, while you're uh, performing the primary injection across that system um, is applied uh, properly. Um, however, it is important to mention that um, if you do have some type of secondary scheme, 
um, where uh, this may communicate to uh, a, another device within your protective system, you need to understand what that is um, before you perform this test because um, if you have some type of scheme where the device that you're trying to test trips um, may communicate to another device and then trip something else in your system. Um, while this test is done uh, with your system offline, um, it, it is important to make sure that you're not going to trip something uh, that's um, in the system that uh, you don't want to take down. Jason. Uh, back over to Dinesh. Uh, Dinesh, what size and quantity of cables can the spy unit take? Uh, I think that's a that's a very good question because uh, 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 I guess the person who asked the question must have performed uh, this kind of testing out in the field because the size and the length of cable would directly impact the amount of current you can get out of the test set. And as you guys know that uh, that the uh, and and Daniel did cover that where he covered the impedance of the circuit. Uh, uh, let me kind of give a little bit background so that way we can we can understand the question better. So every instrument has a certain open circuit voltage, and the the length of the cable uh, going to the breaker and returning back that whole circuit one way length breaker contact resistance and the return path of the of the return cable. All of this is the impedance connected to the to the uh, to the test instrument, and for all practical purposes, the the impedance of the cable is much much greater than the than the resistance of the breaker itself. So if you have longer length, then you you are increasing the impedance of the circuit, and as you know, that current is a function of voltage and impedance. So if I have higher impedance in the circuit, uh, what it would do is that it would reduce the amount of current you can get out of it. So the length and the size of the cable is very important. And as you guys may know that the formula for resistance is rho L over A. So longer the length of the cable, higher the resistance would be. And it is inversely proportional to the area of cross section of the cable. So if you use thicker conductors, then it's very obvious that you would reduce the resistance. And if you reduce the resistance, you can get more current out of it. So now I will come to the says that what size and uh, length of the cable um, uh, is recommended with the SPI. So SPI can give you um, uh, two, 2,000 or 2,200 amps of current. And that current is recommended based upon using a four odd cable with a two feet length one way. Now, uh, if you decide to reduce, decide to increase the length of the cable and keep on using uh, using uh, the four odd cable, then uh, certainly as you would you would increase the length of the cable, uh, the the amount of current you can get out of the instrument. Uh, would reduce, and that's true for any test instrument, let alone the, the spy unit. So with four odd cable and two feet one way distance, uh, um, that's the cable that it comes with, and you would get 2000 amps out of it. Uh, there are cases where what you can do is that you can put uh, multiple conductors together in parallel, that would further reduce the impedance, and then you can increase the length of the cable to offset uh, offset the reduction in the current. So uh, uh, we have seen cases like in in, in nuclear power stations uh, where they have breakers on different floors. Uh, people have used like you know like 10 feet of length, 15 feet of length, but it would come at a compromise of of reduction the level of the for, uh, level of the current you can get out of the unit thanks Dinesh. uh i'm going to send this question over to daniel daniel could you explain a little more on the slide where you mentioned the current would reap double and why is that sure thank you michael let me go back to the slide 
where is it? This one, I think this is the one you were referring. And it has to do with how the, the, the protection element works. Um, if I also go back, I think it was the slide on NIDA, one second. Most of the sensing configuration use a system of, or a system type of summation, right? which is um, looking at the currents you see here in the first uh, point here in the slide. And I'll go back here. <clears throat> so the system is monitoring at the currents on all three phases and the neutral, right? And depending on the direction of currents, that's how the, the system can determine that a ground fault is present, right? So for this test, uh, if you remember, if I go back to my previous slide, uh, if you see the direction of, of the current for the knot trip is opposite, right? If you, you see the, the breaker, we're incoming from the line, getting out of the load, and then on the neutral, we, we're going from bottom to top. So when we do the, the sizing uh, test, and that is the purpose of, of this test, is we inject the current in the same direction, right? And again, because of the summation uh, type uh, 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 system, the trip unit will redouble your test current because it's pretty much adding the two values together. And again, that's how, on this case, you determine that the ratios also are um, uh, um, properly installed for, for those uh, two CTs involved in in the measurement. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, over to Dinesh. Is there any application note that shows the ability of the SPI 225, or sorry, yeah, 225 to connect four units together for higher current application? Uh, uh, again, that, that's, that's a very interesting question. Daniel uh, covered that part as well. Uh, yes, we do have step-by-step uh, -step instructions to show uh, how we can connect four spies in par in parallel to get uh, get I guess four times the current out of the unit. Uh, just just to give you an idea, the the way it works is that you have four units, and each of the spy unit have Ethernet ports on it. And what you do is that you, you stack all the four uh, uh, spy units together, one over each other. And then what you would do is that you would do a daisy chain connection of, of ethernet from one unit to the other, second unit to the third, third to fourth. And then the first unit would become the master unit, other, three units are the slave units, or you can just now then think of those as current boxes, that's all. So you would communicate uh, with your computer through the to the first unit, and then the output terminals of all those four units uh, would be tied in parallel, um, uh, and then from there you would connect to the breaker. And again, as I said, like it's a master-slave configuration, and then uh, you control the master unit, and then um, uh, these four units interact with each other to give you the desired current. Now, the nice thing is that, let's say you, you want to get 5,000 amps out of it. So you are only gonna um, enter the, your, your target current, and then the, all the four test set would do whatever needs to be done to, to, to get that required current. And um, uh, Daniel also mentioned one of the thing, which is that uh, that these spy units have what we call as a feedback loop. So as you know that as the test set, uh, as the test is ongoing, because of the heating of the cable specimen, the current would typically go down. But because we want to run the test at a certain level of current, there is a feedback loop where it would auto-regulate the current. So if the current starting current was 5,000 amps, and now the current is at, I don't know, 4,900, there's a feedback loop mechanism where it would auto-regulate and bring the current back up to 5,000 amps. So it comes very handy where you don't have to manually adjust the current during the during the testing. So, so if anyone is interested in knowing uh, how to use four units in parallel, just let us know and we can send you some documentation on that. 
All right. Next is over to Jason. Uh, Jason, during the time delay test, is it standard to test the ground fault at different percentages, such as two, three hundred percent? So whenever we're testing the uh, time delay for uh, a ground fault system, it is important to perform these tests at uh, um, different um, different time delay uh, uh, points. So um, whenever we we do perform that test, you want to inject um, 200 or 200 uh, percent and, and perform a time delay test, and then. Um, <clears throat> 300% uh, and perform a time delay test. And the reason for this is um, typically you're going to see different values for, for the test results. And this is based on what we talked about earlier with the time current curve. Um, if you look at the time current curve um, from different manufacturers for um, circuit breakers or um, a ground fault relay in the case of, a, a, say, a bolted pressure switch uh, for a zero sequence application, um, your um, your tolerances for your trip time is going to be different based on the amount of current that you inject. And that's why we do this whenever we do that test to make sure that um, depending upon um, the current level that uh, the device sees that it's going to trip within that uh, required uh, time uh, tolerance. Thanks, Jason. Uh, over to Daniel. When testing, is it acceptable to test one phase to verify that the brains are working properly, or should you run the full test on all three phases? Thank you, Michael. I would say, and I re would recommend to run the test on all three phases. I mean, you're right saying that on each one of those uh, measurements, yes, the, the, the trip unit is uh, involved, and, and you're pretty much uh, making sure that that is working, but remember, right, there are other elements, right, individual on, on each phase that will, will be involved. Uh, just name a couple, right, the, the terminals, the, the contacts on, on each one of the, the phases, uh, and the sensing elements, right, the, the CTs, right, so you want to, again, make sure that all of them are in good working condition, so I would say it, it's always recommended to run the measurements on all three phases. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, back over to Jason. When doing maintenance testing, is primary injection recommended instead of using the manufacturer test set that only tests through the relay through the front panel? So doing primary injection is recommended over uh, doing a secondary type test um, using a uh, manufacturer uh, specific uh, test set. And the reason for this is whenever you use that manufacturer specific test set and you do a secondary injection test, all you're really doing is testing the trip, the trip unit um, or the electronic aspect of um, the brains, if you will, of that device. Um, you're not testing any of, um, you're not testing the mechanical function of the device, but you're also not injecting current through the CT of the uh, of the system. So if you're not doing that, then um, there's several aspects of the system that uh, you're really ignoring whenever you do that type of test. Um, I mean, if um, in a situation where it, that's all you want to do is, is uh, test the uh, trip unit of the device, then sure, you can use one of those manufacturer um, specific test sets. However, um, if you really want to uh, test the system and get a proper evaluation of um, what you have and, and to, uh, have confidence in that system and actually tripping whenever you're going to need it to trip in the real world scenario, then um, you need to do this type of primary injection test um, to verify that the system is going to operate properly. Thank you, Jason. Uh, to Daniel. For 6,300 amps low voltage CV, what would the test current be? Thank you, Mike. And I will go back again to one of my slides. Important to uh, take into account two, two things, right? This is from um, NIDA, right? For the pickups that remember, right? Even though when you're testing breakers, like this uh, specific question from, from our audience, right? At 63, I think it's 63. 100 amps for rated current, our ground fault will not be more than 1200 amps. And so that is the maximum current that you will ever need for, for this 
protection element, ground fault protection. And uh, let me show you another part of my presentation here. This is again this table. I took it directly from uh, uh, an actual circuit breaker manual, the maintenance manual. And again, you see that for currents bigger than 1250, your your dial for for it stops being a multiply multiplier and it actually becomes an actual value for current. So maximum is 1200. So for 6300 amps breaker, the the test current will be 1200. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, so Jason, how do you handle a self-powered type trip units where you need, for example, 30% of FLA just to turn on the trip unit? We run into this when we when trying to inject current through the neutral inline CT. Do you need two current testers? Uh, so for this application, um, you know, in the last answer that we gave, we discussed the secondary injection test set for um, different applications. Um, and in some cases, um, you're not going to be able to push enough current um, to operate that device or um, it's not self-powered where um, the CTs of the unit are going to operate that uh, power up that trip unit. So you're going to need that secondary um, injection device just to power up the unit. Um, this is also helpful whenever you're changing settings on the system um, so that um, it just makes it, it's just ease of use whenever you're changing the settings of the of the system between uh, these uh, primary injection tests. So um, it's not necessarily that you need uh, two primary injection test sets, but you're going for the, for this example um, where uh, the trip unit isn't self-powered, you're going to need um, that um, that power supply to be able to um, power up that unit so that the uh, the system is going to operate whenever you do do the uh, the high current injection test. All right, thanks, Jason. Uh, to Dinesh, what is the frequency of doing these tests? So uh, I guess we, we talked about ground fault uh, protection testing and also your regular primary injection testing, which is, you know, like your, your, your short time, long time pickup, those kind of things. So uh, when, and, and also the CTs as well. Uh, so when it comes to the frequency of it, uh, it's it's kind of difficult to 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 pinpoint uh, at, at a certain document. Uh, you can refer to NETA ATS MTS. Uh, there are some uh, some uh, guidelines in that NFPA. Uh, uh, there is a NEMA AB4 document. So these are the places where I would go and look for, and also depending upon where these breakers are located be is is it a critical data center hospital is is it as at, at a nuclear facility so that would also determine how frequently you would do the test and when you start talking about utilities um uh, who who may have these breakers um at at, at, at at a number of different locations they may have their own uh, testing and maintenance program based upon the the predictive maintenance or preventive maintenance that they might follow so so uh, there is no straight answer on this one but there are a lot of documents there are a lot of guidelines that you can use to determine what is the the right uh, frequency or interval at which you should be performing these tests uh, my next question is also for you uh, my experience has shown it's not always possible to get a high current unit into remote locations. Should you have a ductor with a hundred amp capabilities, would it be sufficient to primary inject at that level and verify metering on the trip unit? So again, thanks for that question. Uh, 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 the person who has asked this question uh, certainly knows the challenges uh, in the field. Uh, we are talking about a, a, a instrument that is not lightweight. Um, uh, SPY 2000 might be considered lightweight because you can carry in one hand, but when you start going into 
the instruments that can give you 5,000 amps, 20,000 amps, 60,000 amps instantaneous. These test sets are, are, are difficult to move around. So I certainly see the question um, uh, why it has been asked. So uh, as I mentioned earlier that the right way of performing or checking the condition of the low voltage circuit breaker is primary injection. And when I say primary injection, majority of the breakers that we run into are AC circuit breakers. You, you would run into DC circuit breakers as well, uh, but uh, AC circuit breakers are, are, are the most common ones. And if you want to test those breakers, you would need AC current. So yes, you can um, have a ductor with 100 amp capabilities, but that's not what we are looking at right now. So you have two ways of performing the test one is the primary injection other is the secondary injection uh, primary injection we talked uh, uh, about it a lot it's the most recommended method but yes moving things around can be challenging uh, and that's the reason why with, with the modular functionality like like a spy helps a lot where you don't have a one single piece that you need to take uh, uh, three 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 floor up kind of thing so so that that's an advantage with this with the unit like spy uh, and the other method is the secondary injection method if you absolutely cannot do primary injection the only thing that you you can do is secondary injection then yes yes you can go for the secondary injection method but it will only check the trip devices trip unit the brains of the breaker but if you truly want to check the muscle power of the low voltage circuit breaker, whether it has the capability to interrupt that level of fault current, if you want to check that, then primary injection is the only test that would do that. Thanks for that, Dinesh. Uh, moving on to the next question with Jason. Uh, Jason, how would you sell primary injection testing to a client? Why is primary injection necessary over secondary injection testing? Okay, so uh, earlier in, in the presentation, Daniel talked about standards and the, the requirements for these for this te uh, the primary injection testing and, and kind of what changed in 2017. Um, NFPA 70 and the NEC um, both mandated that um, the primary or excuse me the ground fault systems shall be tested. Um, by a primary injection process. Now, um, you know, prior to this, you know, it was mentioned that it was left up to the contractor or the manufacturer of the equipment on, on how to do these tests. Well, um, whenever you talk about primary injection testing, <clears throat> you're, you're pushing current th through the system in the same manner of a real world application. So, um, you're testing um, the CTs of the system, you're testing um, the uh, the shunt of the system that's actually going to trip the device um, whenever you have that overcurrent condition for the ground fault um, or on your neutral and um, whenever you do a secondary injection test you're not doing any of that so um, like Dinesh just said um, whenever um, you're uh, ensuring that um, the uh, the circuit breaker is going to have um, the ability to trip whenever it's under that uh, ground fault condition. Um, the only way you're going to do this is, is through a primary injection test. Um, it's important to emphasize um, that while secondary injection testing is convenient, um, it's not necessarily an effective test. The only thing that you're doing whenever you do that secondary injection test is testing um, the trip unit or the the brains or the, uh, the relay of the system. So. Um, you're, you're not uh, testing your neutral CT, um, you're not testing uh, the mechanical function of the device or um, the, the CTs that are on the, uh, the primary um, conductor of, of that device. So for all these reasons, um, plus the mandate uh, of the standards, um, this is why primary injection testing is required. Thanks, Jason. Uh, back over to Dinesh. What are the output power requirements to the SPI-225? If using four units, it seems like it could be difficult to obtain four input sources. Uh, uh, thanks for the question. So 
the SPY 225 can operate from your regular wall outlet. It can take 120 volt as the input source uh, or input voltage, or you can also use 240 volt of input power. So uh, 120 volt obviously is very standard, very common for here in US. And uh, uh, there might be some places where 240 volt might be applicable as well. Now on the contrary, I think that it's much easier to get access to, to 120 volt outlet with a 15 amp circuit or 16 amp circuit contrary to to you know like a 480 volt 350 amp service if you really want high high levels of current not every place would have 480 volt of service available so with with the spy unit and if you want to use four units uh, uh, together there are there are there are two things that you have to keep in mind one is that all the four all the four spy that you're going to use uh, uh, need to be powered from the same phase. So, um, because we don't want any phase angles when we're going to trigger at time zero all the all the uh, all the spy units, we don't want any phase differences between the the currents coming from different uh, uh, different uh, spy units. So, one requirement is that they should be on 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 the same phase and if you are planning to to max out the current let's say uh, i don't know 2000 amps at 2000 amps it might draw close to 15 amps from the input source in those cases you would want those four units to be on four different circuits like four different breakers uh, and, and what that would do is that you won't trip the the input breaker uh, because you are maxing out the amount of current you can get from that wall outlet. But let's say you are only planning to use 4000 amps, uh, then you can put two spy on one circuit and other two spy on the other circuit and you should still be okay. So it all depends upon the amount of current you're trying to get from the spy units and uh, based upon that you would decide how many circuits you would need, but all of them need to be on the same phase. <clears throat> Thanks, Dinesh. Uh, it looks like we have time for one last question. I'm going to bring it back to Daniel since it started here with you. When primary injecting, would you test the breaker at its lowest settings to prevent stressing the breaker for an acceptance test? Thank you, Michael. Well, this is this is a very good, good question and one that uh, we get a, a lot uh, together with um, the, the one that Jason uh, responded to, I think a couple of questions back uh, about uh, comparing or, or, or selling or, or, or selecting primary uh, injection over secondary injection, right? Of course, uh, we always uh, worry about overstressing our, de our devices uh, when when we perform these measurements, right? Uh, and again, we get this question a lot. We have uh, this debate. We have had it many, many times, uh, obviously internally and with customers. Uh, and yes, when we are testing with primary injection, we do are, we, we are uh, stressing the, the circuit breaker, right? Because we're, as I mentioned already, the, the, actual definition of testing with primary injection is duplicating the the, the conditions um, of, of fault in service so yes you are stressing it and when we dial back all the the to, to the lowest setting i mean we are pretty much uh, proving that the trip unit it is uh, sensing correctly Right, that all the elements uh, that compose the trip unit, right, the sensing, the, the, the current transformers, the, the control wiring, the logic in the trip unit is working correctly. But right, remember that we, when we're discussing circuit breakers, right, it's a protection device, and we have them there sometimes, a lot of times, to, to protect uh, uh, critical systems, right? That, we don't want them to fail. That's that's again part of our protection system. 
when again when we dial back yes we we prove that the trip unit is working correctly but when the circuit breaker operates when it has to interrupt the fault right it has to dissipate energy and and the breaker is constructed in a way that should be able to do this many times and yes it is a, a finite number of times it is not no, there is no manufacturer that will tell us a circuit breaker will work indefinitely, right? It will actually, will, most of them will give us a rating of how many times it can interrupt a fault current, and we also even get grabs on depending on on the the the, the rating or the, the actual fault current, how many operations we can expect that breaker to 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 have or to to perform its function correctly. But then we go into the, again, the debate of saying how critical this system is that I want to be 100% sure that the breaker will be able to interrupt a fault current. So I, I, I think, I'm, I'm, I hope I'm answering uh, your question. As again, I, I would say it is valid, yes, but if, if it is a critical system, I personally would rather test it at the full rated uh, capability, whatever the setting is for service, I would uh, advocate to, to test the breaker at that setting, and depending on the criticality of, of the system it's protecting. And uh, I don't know if, uh, if the National Jason want to add something. Yeah, D Daniel, I, I would just add one comment, and, and what you said is absolutely correct. Uh, the, one analogy that I can give is that let's say you're preparing for a marathon or, 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 or a race and you have to, to run for 10 miles and in your preparation, in your preparation, you say that, you know what, I know that this marathon, my target is five miles an hour and it's a 10 mile race. So is it okay? Is it okay? If I run only for 20 minutes at five miles, and if I can do that, does it guarantee that when the race or when the marathon is going to happen, would I be do, able to do 10 miles at the same speed? And that's exactly what this, this question is asking, that if, if you're going to test at lower setting, yes, it may pass. It might give you an indication that it may work, but when the race actually happens, when when the amount of current that it needs to dissipate, the amount of stamina you need for the race, do you have that? Does the breaker has that capacity to dissipate the energy? You you would never find out because you never ran the test. You you never ran ten miles at five miles an hour to to check that. So yes, there, there is a probability that it might work. But that's a that's a guesswork at that point of time. All right, thanks, Thank guys. Uh, yeah, it looks like that's all the time we have for our Q and A session today. Uh, we apologize if we did not get your question live, but we will be working to follow up with you offline. As a reminder, a copy of the presentation, certificate of attendance, and a link to the video recording of this webinar will be emailed to everyone in about two business days. I'd like to thank you all for attending. If you could, please remember to answer our survey. That survey will include a field for you to request a quote or a demo if you're interested. But once again, I'd like to thank you all for attending and I hope you all have a great weekend.